All right. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I am pleased to present our guest this week, Dr. Wes Gray, the founder of Alpha Architect, an asset management firm dedicated to an impact mission of empowering investors through education. As always, for those of you out in the audience, please feel free to post those questions and comments in the live chat section throughout the presentation, but keep in mind we will be holding them until the end of things. For those of you that are our international audience members, let us know where you're coming from. We always welcome you guys. And without anything further from me, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Wes. We can jump into the presentation and get the ball rolling here. All right. Appreciate it, Graham. Let me uh, see if I can go past my boomer mentalities and get this thing fired up. All right, can you see it? All right, great. Um, so what this talk is gonna be about is usually I talk about factor investing, uh, which is essentially a catch-all term for systematic investing or quant investing or what have you. And we talk about how it's simple, but not easy. And for the guru audience, since I know we have a lot of value fans here, and I'm obviously a value fan myself, um, I've tailored this one to talk about value investing is simple, but not easy. And I'm going to talk in particular about our style of value investing, which is the systematic form. Um, also talk about why I used to be a stock picker and I'm no longer a stock picker. Um, so first, a quick introduction to our firm and what we're all about. So our mission as a firm is to empower investors through education. That's what we've always been about. I used to be a former professor at Drexel, um, was an academic researcher. And then Jack, who's one of my partners here on the left, he's also a PhD geek. Uh, he was actually my research assistant that was assigned to me. Um, so we've always been about education, um, doing academic research, and then something happened. So we've been running a blog now going past 10 years, which is crazy to think about. Uh, well, I used to just talk about research, like academic research, findings out there, how you can you know, use this stuff to maybe try to make some money. Well, it turned out other people were reading our blog. Um, and so while I was a professor, literally a billionaire, uh, multi-billionaire called me up and they had just survived the 2008 crisis. And they used to be the biggest hedge fund investor that you can imagine, biggest fee payer on the street. And they basically got sick and tired of it. They're like, we're not doing this anymore. We want to control our own capital, control our own taxes, and let's do quant because it seems like it's a lot more efficient. And of course, if you get cold call from a, you know, someone who's really rich, even if you're a professor and you don't have a real job, which was my status at the time, I'll still take the call and hear what they have to say. Well, long story short, these guys put us in business back in 2010. And that's where we kind of started. It was doing a systematic value strategy. And, you know, 10 years later, you know, we basically do three things today. On the far left here was kind of that legacy business where we run, we're an RIA and we run SMAs for ultra high net worths who are really keen on tax management. Um, and then we also ended up launching like our own uh, family of ETFs. And then finally, the third thing we do now, which is quickly becoming our biggest business, is we actually run infrastructure for other people that want to launch ETFs because there's a lot of tax benefits and a lot of other reasons that people want to do that. And for some reason right now, everyone and their sister wants to launch an ETF. So that business is kind of going crazy. But we're going to talk about factors um, and, and, and specifically the value factor. And the format of the talk is, is we're going to first talk about, well, what the heck is value factor investing or, or value investing with a computer? Um, and then we're going to address the question, well, if I'm just buying like the top 10 cheapest stocks on P ratio, is that just maybe too easy? And has that been arbitraged away? Maybe, maybe not. But in order to answer that question, we need to then step back and ask a fundamental question of, well, how do markets work in the first place? Like, why would a low PE stock strategy earn extra returns in the past? Um, and then finally, um, at the end, we're going to talk about, well, why would this, you know, this kind of brain dead value strategy work in the future or maybe not work? Um, so this is going to be an all inclusive topic and discussion about understanding financial markets and particular the value factor or systematic value. So first off, what is the value factor? 
But before we get into that, I want to highlight my background because it's important to understand the context. So back in the day, starting in 99, so I guess over 20 years ago now, um, I started as a hardcore fundamental stock picker, deep value, Ben Graham, Warren Buffett type, right? Right at the height of the internet bubble. And obviously got lucky that I was a value investor at the end of the internet bubble. Cause as everyone knows, the internet bubble blew up and then value as a style went on one of its best streaks of all time for the next, you know, five to 10 years. Of course I was in that. And I thought I was a genius because I made a ton of money. But then later down the road, I also lost my shirt. Um, and I happened to enter the PhD program at the University of Chicago, where I got to hang out with this nice, young, bald gentleman here named Dr. Fama, um, or Professor Fama, who happens to have a Nobel Prize for his work on understanding the so-called efficient market hypothesis which long story short, basically says all prices are fair and trying to beat the market is a waste of your time. And what happened to me is I entered this program in 2002 um, and I said, well, I'm a stock picker and I've been making a ton of money. I'm a genius. And then Professor Fama said, you're actually an idiot, little punk, um, and you don't know anything. Well, of course, in my dissertation, one part of that was trying to prove to Professor Fama that actual stock pickers who use a value style can actually add value. And I ended up doing that. Uh, I, I used a lot of data from this organization called uh, Value Investors Club. And, and it was great. Like, hey, all these stock picks actually beat the market by, by a large amount. But then simultaneous to that, I also found out that if I, instead of using the stock picks of these really smart hedge fund managers, if I had simply bought a portfolio of really cheap, really high quality kind of mid mid cap stocks, I would end up in the exact same place, but with way less brain damage. Um, so that sort of analysis kind of finally convinced me on my journey from stock picker to, I think, quants are idiots to saying, hey, quants are actually pretty smart because they pull monkey brain out of the equation but maybe we can build a quant model to kind of be a robotic value investor and get us 95% of the benefit of being a traditional value investor, but without all the brain damage. At least that was the, the current state of thinking. So that's great. That's the background. What the heck is systematic value investing if, if you're never familiar with this concept, uh, as opposed to just good old fashioned value investing, where we're going to try to calculate the DCF, figure out the intrinsic value of all the free cash flows, discount it to today, you know, compare it to the current value and try to make you know, bets on that. Well, systematic value is, is basically doing something similar, but it's just using computers. And the best analogy I have is, is the one from the Moneyball story. And so if you're not familiar with the Moneyball story, essentially, I think this was early 2000, the Oakland A's are broke and they're competing against the New York Yankees who have infinite budget. And they keep losing while the Yankees keep winning because they have a lot more money. And so they're in a situation where they have to do more with less and come up with a better way of picking baseball players. And they decide to go down the quant approach. And they have the bright idea of instead of hiring hundreds of scouts to go, you know, see how buff and how good the baseball players are, in person and shake their hands, they just use hard data on the performance of these different baseball players or their characteristics or their factors. And then they build models that try to identify, hey, which characteristics of these baseball players actually map to positive expected return, risk return outcomes. Um, so maybe we don't wanna pay like $100 million for the most expensive player, because that's, you know, that's like a growth stock. It's, it's not a great deal, but maybe there's this geeky looking person um, that we can get for 1 million a year, but their on-base percentage is amazing. And, and, you know, so that was kind of the analysis they did. Well, essentially systematic value investing or really any systematic investment approach is the same idea. Um, we're going to go look at stocks, which are now our new baseball players, and we're going to go look at different characteristics of these baseball players um, that are obviously relevant to the stock market. 
to try to map, build portfolios that then map to specific uh, risk reward outcomes that we might find favorable. And you know, classic one for value might be, hey, we're going to focus on you know these baseball players, a aka stocks. You know, the price to earnings ratio on these things, the return on assets, maybe like a quality measure, uh, market cap, like a size liquidity measure. And we're gonna we're gonna build systems that basically take all these inputs and help us build essentially a computerized value investment portfolio. Um, and of course, the upside of this is. You know, it's very efficient, uh, very low cost to operate. Um, obviously, you got to put a lot of time to think about, you know, what's the model? Why does it work? Why is this not just data mining, et cetera? But it's, you know, in general, mo most of the time you can find that you can achieve 90% or 95% of what you need with a computer as opposed to involving your monkey brain. Um, and in my case, I just was not a good stock picker. So other people understand they're much better stock pickers. And God bless you for trying, but it just wasn't my thing. So I use computers now. Now, why do people even like this idea? Well, this is the reason people like to make money. Um, and so what we have on this chart here is this is basically a hundred year history of the most brain dead value investment strategy you could ever imagine. Every year you sort the stock universe on the 10% cheapest on book to market ratio, the blue line. It, it, FF Val stands for Fama French value. So you can grab all this data off Ken French's website. And then we map that performance, like the invested growth performance against the S&P 500. And so if you scroll way off here to the right, why do people like this? Well, over the long haul, doing this very simple generic value factor or, or systematic value approach you end up with a lot more money than if you just went into the passive stock market. And so the question is, well, okay, that's all you need to do to beat the market, like buy cheap stocks is now that we're in the computer age, there's machine learning and all these like 500 IQ people. Um, well, maybe it's just too easy. Like, like maybe that was a, uh, that was legacy, but, but now we're in a new world. So, so things have changed. Um, and we're going to, we're going to talk about that here, but the bottom line is, Value investing is essentially money or value factor investing is essentially money ball for finance, right? We're going to use computers to kind of codify what value investors do. Um, that's our style. And that's just background what it is. And now we're going to deep dive into this question of, well, that might be too easy and too simple. Um, and why might people think that? Well, if you look over the long history, as discussed, you know, who wouldn't want to buy value stocks? Like, geez, that seems obvious. Like make five times as much money, I'm in. Whereas now you look at the recent 10-year performance where the blue line here is the SP 500 and the black line is just a generic uh, value index. Well, value investing as a style, whether you did it as a stock picker uh, for the most part, or you did it as a systematic investor, was probably one of the worst ideas you could possibly have on the planet Earth. Um, and value as a style, as many people say, is basically dead. And sure, it's on a comeback here, you know, last six months or whatever. But if you look over the long, quote unquote, history, it, it's been pretty ugly. It would have been much better off to buy firms that are, you know, very, very expensive with no earnings um, and seem to be going to infinity as opposed to focusing on fundamentals, price paid, et cetera. But it gets worse. Uh, there's the 20 year history of the rolling relative five year performance between this generic buy 10% cheapest stock strategy, that same strategy over here that crushes the market over hundred years um, relative to the S&P 500. So let me orient you to this chart. So any, period where the little wiggly blue line is below zero, like let's say, for example, here back in 2009, it's around negative six or 7%. What's that saying is that over the past five years before that, this generic value strategy has lost by 7% per year versus the S&P, which means that on an absolute basis, it could be 100 percentage points under the S&P, right? The S&P could be up 100%, you could be flat, right? So anytime this blue wiggly line is below zero, it means that whether you were 
hired to manage money for someone else or you manage your own money, you're going to be staring at an abysmal five-year look back period where the generic market literally crushed your soul. And what you'll notice is it's not just the t- past 10 years where value's been bad. In general, over the past 20 years, there's plenty of opportunities where over even a five-year look-back window, you, you're just going to feel like an idiot and probably just throw in the towel, right? And so the question is, well, why is that? Like, we know that there's this 100-year performance record of just, hey, let's go buy cheap stocks. That seems to do pretty good in you know, every market you can get data on. But in recent memory, it's just terrible, uh, like really terrible, and especially on a relative basis. So one of the hypotheses out there that we take seriously is like, well, maybe it's just too easy. Because in the old days on the left here, you had a bunch of idiots, no one had computers, everyone's like a gambler, you know, just old school, we'll call it. And then nowadays here on the right, you, you have people like Jim Simons or, or even Charlie Tian, the, the founder of uh, Guru Focus, you know, they got PhDs in physics. And there's no way you're going to be smarter than these people. And they've kind of arbitraged the easy money out of the system. And so the implication here is that more brains coming online, more data, more computing power is what has led to the underperformance of value strategies, specifically these systematic value strategies. So that's an interesting theory. And, it, and it's basically a correlation argument. More brains equals bad performance for brain dead things. And, and we can look at this. So if we look over here on the right, this is now a long history of over the past 100 years of uh, five-year look-back performance. And as I mentioned, this far right chart is basically, this is the amplified version of that, right? So the last 20 years, it'd be like, geez, why would you want to do that stupid strategy? It must be dead because the smart people took advantage of it. That's what's over here on the right. But then when we open the kimono and we show the whole period here, we notice that there's multiple time periods where value on a relative basis is literally like a soul sucking strategy that will make you want to jump off a bridge. Right. And so the question then is, okay, it's not just the case that value stinks right now. It's always had episodes of stinking. And we can't really make the the causation argument that more brains, more technology, more data, whatever, leads to poor performance. Because if we want to make that hypothesis, we'd have to then state, well, why back here at the end of World War II did all of a sudden value premium was rocking and then it bombed out? Like, did all the GIs come back and get PhDs in physics and start doing machine learning? Probably not. Like, why did it all of a sudden start working, say, in the late 70s, right? Like, and everyone's got different theories, but the main point is that value as a strategy works over the long time, but in the short run, it's possibly one of the worst ideas you can possibly do from a behavioral perspective, because you need to be prepared to, on a relative basis, underperform over five-year stretches like that's no big deal, because it's going to happen many times over if you're actually doing it right, which is sad, but I think probably true. So anyways, is value and factor investing, is this just too easy? Possibly, like maybe you shouldn't be able to earn a lot of money by just buying a bunch of cheap PE stocks. Um, But it's certainly not the case, or at least it's a hard argument to make that the reason value hasn't worked in recent memory is just because there's too many brains out there. But so in order to understand, well, well, why hasn't it worked and why would it, why do we think it may or may not work in the future? It's really important that before we even go into that question, we really understand the most fundamental of questions. How do markets work in the first place? Which a lot of investors and people that allocate capital, they don't actually know what the hell's going on. They're just gamblers or speculators for the most part. They've never actually thought about this this fundamental question. And the reason they probably haven't thought about it is it turns out it's actually incredibly complicated. And so anytime something is way too complicated and, you know, way above my pay grade and IQ, let's just go talk to the smartest people on the planet who this is all they think about. And they're considered uh, from a societal perspective, the biggest brains in the room. Well, turns out that there's two Nobel Prize winners 
who have opposing opinions about how markets work. Um, so you can only imagine that if, you know, we got Professor Fama on one hand, he says, well, the way markets work is markets are efficient. So risk and return, return is priced according to, you know, the fundamental laws of market physics, I guess. And a price always equals its fundamental value because of competition. And of course, on the other side of that Nobel Prize, this is in 2013, um, there's Bob Schiller, Robert Schiller, Dr. Schiller, um, also a PhD, also a genius. And he has the exact opposite opinion. His opinion of the markets is that, wait, this is all driven by sentiment, humans, there's a lot of mispricing. And, and he throws it back to Fama and in this bubble says, have you ever met actual people? Like they do not act like computers. They're, they're not maniacs that just can stick through a strategy for 20 years and not even blink if it underperforms. They don't watch CNBC. They don't get influenced by a lot of things. Um, you know, he makes that argument. And so what we'll do is we'll kind of digest both of their frameworks and, and why they, they are probably important for understanding how markets work broadly and why value works in particular or may not work. Um, so first let's walk through it. So what is the idea behind efficient market prices and why is that theory in place? Well, the efficient market, price, uh, market hypothesis at the most, uh, what they call the semi-strong uh, hypothesis is that essentially prices incorporate all past performance data like technicals and all everything you know publicly about fundamentals, right? So prices always equal the net present value of the cash flows adjusted for risk. Um, and the reason for that, like the underlying implied assumption is that that exists because of competition in the marketplace and low arbitrage costs, i.e. when really smart people with supercomputers or big brains see $20 bills lying on the pavement, they pick them up, right? Because why wouldn't you do that? And so to the extent that $20 bills are easy to grab because the arbitrage cost of doing it is very low, well, then we would expect to not see free $20 bills lying on the ground. And voila, we have the efficient market hypothesis and the logic essentially why prices should always equal fundamental value. People like free money, basically. But it's based on this assumption of low frictional costs. What is the Bob Schiller argument? Well, he says people are crazy. And well, that's fine. People can be crazy and throw $20 bills on the ground, but that doesn't mean that prices are screwed up because you can have tons of idiots in the market, but as long as it's easy to arbitrage them, prices will still equal fundamental value. So Professor Schiller here needs something else involved to make his argument. And that's the argument of high arbitrage or frictional cost. So pretend we still have that $20 bill on the ground and let's say I'm the idiot and I dropped it. Well, what if I dropped that $20 bill on the ground and there happens to be a grizzly bear hanging out in the area? And grizzly bears love to eat people and he smells some people on the $20 bill. So he goes over, puts it in his mouth because it's kind of cool. Well, now let's say there's some smart guy or gal out there and they're like, wow, there's a $20 bill on the pavement. That's weird. That's not supposed to happen. But oh, wait a second. It's in a grizzly bear's mouth. And if I try to extract that $20 bill, it's quote unquote free money, but I might die while I get that free money, right? So in the real marketplace, there's situations like this where there seems like there's $20 bills out there and it might be a real $20 bill, but the problem is there's a grizzly bear hanging over it, right? Because it's very expensive or dangerous to try to take advantage of idiots sometimes. And so what the inefficient market hypothesis says is they say, hey, on average prices probably equal roughly fundamental value, but that's not a great theory because there's so much noise tied to mispricing and the chaos and the, you know, the sentiment of the marketplace because of high frictional costs that prices don't usually actually reflect fundamental value. It, it's just, there's other things going on. So this is kind of like the Bob Schiller behavioral finance argument, they call it. So, okay, great. Those are two theories on how the market works, why it, why it works. And it's two Nobel Prize winners who, if you got them in a room, they probably go fight each other. 
Um, actually, they probably play tennis, but but you get the idea. Um, and so the answer is, well, they're both probably right. And so we should use the knowledge of different Nobel Prize winners to understand how and why markets fundamentally work, whether you're systematic value investor, whether you're a stock picker, whether you buy bonds, whether you, you know, buy triple levers in Zimbabwe swaps, everything, in my opinion, will eventually fall into this generic framework, where on the right, if you want to earn excess returns, you're going to have to deal with two realities. You're going to have to, one, have some fundamental additional market risk for whatever you're doing. It just, it's simply not the case that you're going to find $20 bills out there, right? It's, it's, there's going to be something. If you're going to earn higher returns, you should look for why this is fundamentally risky, i.e. T-bills are a lot different than owning Tesla stock, right? It's just, there's different risk profile and they're tied to market risk. But then there's another bucket where, okay, I get it's a little bit riskier, but it seems to be undervalued or overvalued, but it's, it's the grizzly bear problem. But if I do this trade or I build this portfolio, I might die before I make money. And going back to the Tesla example, let's say you thought Tesla was overvalued, right? So clearly there, you should earn extra return versus T-bills because it has higher market risk. But let's say you thought it was overvalued and you're like, I'm going to go short Tesla. Well, God bless whoever decides to go short something like Tesla because you can get steamrolled in, in different career risk and like fundamental risk of trying to be short, uh, you know, run away train. You might be right in the end and that $20 bill might have existed, but you, you could die along the way, right? So the main point is any investment approach and in particular value, as you'll see, you want to be able to map of, of why do I get to earn extra money versus other people I trade with in the marketplace? It's going to boil down to no pain, no gain. If I can't at, look in the mirror and say, well, my value investing strategy is going to earn extra money and I can identify the extra market risk, i.e. owning Kohl's is riskier fundamentally than owning Amazon, right? Because they're just different business models. But I also need to understand the career risk. Like, why aren't all the other smart people doing this? Like, why doesn't, you know, iShares or, or whatever, someone else, why aren't they running this portfolio like I am? And, and why is it painful for them to do so? And if I can't address these fundamental questions and I just think, oh, I'm just smarter than everyone, it just means you, you probably are the sucker at the table and you probably shouldn't be doing what you're doing. So it's very important to understand this framework and we'll walk through it. And again, I'll map this back uh, more and more towards reality here until we, until we get to the end. So first one, market risk. Okay, this one's so easy, you can explain it on a napkin. And I stole this from a dude on Twitter, give him credit here, where it's simple, right? You got the X axis of risk and you have the Y axis of return. The market risk theory or the efficient market hypothesis is really simple. If you see something in number two bucket that has low risk and high returns, it's called Bernie Madoff. It's a fraud. It does not exist, period. You shouldn't be doing stuff like that. It's too good to be true. Probably is. Um, then you have down here on the bottom right corner, the stupid category, number four. These are things that are really high risk and the expected return actually probably stinks. So when your 20-year-old cousin asks you, asks you to invest in his you know, cryptocurrency VC fund, um, that's probably just stupid, right? It's tons of risk. And let's be honest, does your 20-year-old cousin really know that much about, you know, crypto VC investing? Probably not. You know, we don't want to do that either. Most investments through the market risk category and something we should always be fundamentally aware of, are going to fall on that arrow, right? Either one, low risk, low return, or high risk, high return. One shouldn't expect to be able to get free lunches. And this would always be uh, you know, a key component of any investment you look at considering this reality, because it's always going to be in place at some level. There is no such thing as pure $20 bills on the ground. Great. That's pretty brain dead. Let's talk about the more complicated one. And that's the one of career risk. And it's probably the one that's most exploitable by DIY investors and people that have the um, judgment character and ability to kind of see past their nose and think, you know, 20 years out. 
And so there's a lot of different career risks and frictional costs, AKA grizzly bears that sit over the $20 bill when you're trying to arbitrage in financial markets. But probably the easiest one to understand and probably the most influential, especially within the context of, of systematic value strategies is what they call career risk. And so this is, well, I'll walk you through here, but, but this was a paper written on uh, Journal of Finance back in 1997 called The Limits of Arbitrage. And what Schleifer and Vishni do is they say, hey, okay, Fama keeps telling us that prices always reflect risk and reward, but we've been an asset manager business for a long time. And what we've realized is that investors are short-term performance chasers, no matter what you tell them. And what they say is, let's pretend you have this hypothetical perfect investor. And they sit over here at now, T equals zero, and they manage other people's money. And not only are we going to assume they're the perfect investor, let's assume they're God. Let's assume they actually know the future of the world and all outcomes. And they've identified a stock that in the long run at T equals two is going to double in value. And it's a guarantee because they know the future. However, in the short run, they can't control the minions out there called humans. And sometimes they do crazy stuff, right? Sometimes that stock value will move towards fundamental value, but other times it could actually get worse before it gets better. And so why is this a problem if you're a fundamental long-term oriented investor? Well, it wouldn't be. However, most people, again, can't think long-term and they always think relative. So what this asset manager here would think is like, well, great. This is a long-term arbitrage opportunity and I'm managing other people's money, but I got a problem because if I buy this stock, which I know is a double because I, I know the future, that'd be awesome if it kind of moves towards fundamental value because in the short run, you know, I get to show great performance and my clients are like, hey, here's more AUM. I'll keep paying you your fee. Like you're awesome. Like, you know, you're Warren Buffett and, and you're like, okay, that, that's cool. That's a good outcome. But then you also recognize like, holy cow, there's also a chance that this could get a lot worse before it gets better. And in that scenario, when I, when I drop 50% and I go back to my clients and I say, Hey guys and gals, I'm telling you, I understand I'm down 50% relative to this market but I'm God, I'm Warren Buffett, I really am that awesome. You should just double down right now. And of course, knowing the reality of human psychology and relative performance and benchmark hugging and chasing, all these other things, the clients are gonna be like, thanks God, I'm taking my money elsewhere because this you know, slick willy three-piece suit dude at Merrill has a way better pitch than you about whatever, we're out. And so now I sit back here at now, as this really smart, godlike asset manager. And I think, you know what? I'm not going to do this investment. This is crazy because if I do this and I have this downside thing and, I, and my performance does poorly relative to the index, I could lose my entire business. So, yeah, that's an arbitrage opportunity, but I ain't touching that with a 10 foot pole. Right. So, anyways. This is a real effect in, in financial markets, and it's a reason why huge institutions and large portfolios and even the smartest people in the room, when you look at their portfolios of stocks, they basically look like the S&P with a little noise. And you think like, well, if you actually put all that effort in, all you can do is just own the S&P with a little noise. Why wouldn't you actually bet on your real conviction bets? This is usually why. It's, it's very expensive from a careerist standpoint to take advantage of long-term opportunities, even if they're staring you in the face. So what is even crazier about this is, you know, we, we're quant geeks. Um, so we actually went back in time and created the so-called God portfolio. We created a long-term oriented portfolio where you get a cheat. And, and we use this thing called the Chris database where we start 1927 and we cheat because we get to know the best performing stocks over the next five years. And we buy the top 10% best performing stocks today in 1927 that we already know are the best performing stocks over the next five years. So this is like the God portfolio we call it, right? And if you look at the performance of the God portfolio over the past, whatever it is, 90 some odd years, um, 
obviously it kicks butt, right? Over the long haul, you compound at 30% annualized a year, i.e. you would be a trillionaire almost if you did that for 30 years, whereas the market was also pretty good. The U.S. market is around 10%. So that shouldn't come as a surprise, right? If I actually knew, you know, these long-term stocks, well, obviously I'm going to do great. But here is what's insane. This now is the drawdown profile of the God portfolio. It's literally the perfect stock picking portfolio and the S&P 500. And what you'll notice is, is perfect stock picking does not insulate you from market chaos. You can still lose your shirt and look like a total idiot and have people asking you, why did you lose money? Why are you down 80%? And so obviously it, it's just an amazing finding. Perfection will still have to endure tons of chaos. And if you're managing other people's money, even the perfect portfolio will a lot of times subject you to a lot of this questioning of like, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You know, well, the Fed did it or, or whatever. There's a hundred stories, but this is just a fascinating finding that we kind of serendipitously found. This wasn't the intent originally. Uh, of the strategy. Um, the intent of the strategy was originally to try to figure out what are the factors that drive perfect portfolios. And, and then we quickly realized, well, even with the perfect portfolio, it's not solving our fundamental problem of having to look like an idiot sometimes. Um, so let's make that more realistic. Well, let's look at Warren Buffett. So this here is a chart back when I started value investing in late 90s where the black line is Berkshire Hathaway and the blue line is the triple Qs. And this is weird saying this because I almost feel like it's deja vu, but in this nine month period, Berkshire Hathaway underperformed by 150 percentage points to the tech Titans. And it was the same arguments. Well, tech has taken over. You don't understand fundamentals. You don't understand intangible value. Like cash flows aren't as important as growth, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it was the classic case, but obviously everyone said Warren Buffett is a total idiot. Of course, over the next 10 years, he like crushed everyone's souls, but this is a real thing. And, and in, in many respects, it's analogous to what is going on today, um, where value as a style just stinks relative to triple Qs and everyone says it's dead and what have you. But so Buffett's a perfect example of this. Um, and then factors are a perfect example of this, where again, this is your hundred year five-year relative performance chart of just doing generic value, which we know historic over long periods of time outperform buying S&P. But as you also notice, anytime that line is below zero, you got fired because you spent five years underperforming the index, looking like an idiot, and no one believes that your system works anymore, right? So long story short is how do markets work? I think in the end, they work because these factors or these strategies or what have you in the end proxy for increased market risk and career risk. And you're essentially getting paid for pain. Um, it's not easy. Buying top 10% PE stock sounds easy, but really what it's doing is buying a lot of risk and buying a lot of career risk, which is in reality, extraordinarily painful. And that's why presumably it might work. Um, but let's address that question. Well, what will drive factors or value investing or momentum investing or what you pick your investment poison uh, in this context, we'll talk about value, but why do we expect value to work as a strategy in the future? Well, why do you think markets work? How do you think markets work? And if you think strategies will get compensated because they take on additional fundamental risk because people don't like to own risky stuff and they're willing to pay up some return for it. And if you also believe that there's a lot of career risk and frictional cost of actually doing your particular strategy, i.e. there's a ton of pain, well, that's another reason why someone on the other side of the table might be willing to give up performance to you. But so if you believe in this kind of framework, the appropriate question would not be what, why would factors or why would value work in the future? It'd be the question of why wouldn't factor investing or value investing work if it fundamentally holds riskier securities and it's totally painful and annoying to exploit. It would, it would actually be the opposite. It would be really weird if value is a strategy which is fundamentally riskier and sucks to do, earned lower returns in expectation 
because that would just mean markets are just fundamentally broken, which I don't think they are. So I'm almost done here, Graham. I'll give it, I got one more minute. Um, so everyone thinks, well, great. This is awesome. What an opportunity. Uh, I'm a long-term thinker. I'm totally into evidence. I don't have any biases like the five-year relative performance. Like, yeah, that's for the losers. Let's get after it and earn higher returns and just go buy a bunch of value stocks. Like we'll go 10% cheapest PE stocks and we'll, you know, dominate the S&P over the next hundred years. This is what everyone likes to think. And then I got to always remind them, hey, wait a second. Uh, you know, just as a reminder, you're a human too. And we all are humans. This stuff is really simple, but fundamentally it can't be easy or you wouldn't get paid. So everywhere you look, and in this context as a value investor, you're always going to see reasons why this is stupid and why you need to switch it up. It's just a fact of life. And so some of the things that, that we've learned over the years on, on how to solve that problem, you can never cure it completely, is you know, focus on education. In general, the more people understand fundamentally that there's no free lunch and you got to just be disciplined and process oriented, and here's the data on how this works, why it works, the more they control and understand information, the better prepared and defensible they are against you know, craziness in the market. Same thing with transparency. Like if people understand the system, they, they get how it works, they understand the process, that's always desirable to a black box. Um, because when, when things get bad, a black box is like, oh, that's stupid. Let's go get the next black box. Or something that's systematic, you know, totally transparent, people understand. You know, even when things go bad, they're like, well, I kind of understand the process and still makes sense. Let's stick to it. And then, of course, there's general behavioral management. But it, it, what I'll, I'll leave everyone with here um, is that in the end, it, at least in my experience today, and I'm always, always learning, is it seems like investing is, is really 99% behavior management and 1% the actual process, where, whereas people obviously spend a lot more time on the process. And that's not to say that it doesn't matter. Like you need 100% to be successful. But that 1% on the specifics or nuance of your process, frankly, is important, but not really compared to the other 90 cent, 99% of, are you disciplined? You know, can you focus on the process or are you subject to outcome bias? You know, all these sort of things. Um, and so what we usually recommend is that if you can't, you know, control your behavior, and Buffett says this as well, just go buy a Vanguard fund. Because um, value investing is extremely difficult and it's simple, but not easy. So I'll leave it, leave it at that, Graham, and uh, you know, open it up for questions. All righty. Well, Wes, thank you so much for taking us through that intense presentation. There, lots of information for those of you out there in the audience. Lots going on. Obviously, all those slides will be available for you to look back on. Uh, lots of great memes there as well for people to take a peek at. Lots of entertainment there. Um, absolutely a, an interesting presentation there, different than most of our, our other uh, other guests on the show. Uh, we do have a couple questions coming in here now uh, that are rolling in, and I'm sure more will roll in. Uh, we do have some hellos sure. as well, uh, people saying hi from Switzerland, uh, a couple from Philadelphia, a couple from Canada. Um, so oh. hello to all of you out there around the world. Uh, first question that we do have rolling in here. Um, asking if you think uh, sector rotation via ETFs is reasonable at all. Yeah, so so I mean, like this is not a a, va a value strategy generally. Like like usually with like we're also big believers in momentum and other things. Like I, I got past my original um, hundred percent all in on the value religion. I'm still I'm still a card carrying uh, you know value investor. Like I'm not giving up the religion. But I just like to have multiple religions in a portfolio sense. So, so in the context, if I were a relative strength or technical or momentum investor, I do believe that that momentum type strategies can work in sector rotation or individual securities. But in the end, it's going to boil back to that same framework I just mentioned. Those strategies work over the long haul, all on paper. But a lot of times, they fundamentally engage in additional market risk and tons of pain and anguish. Like there's a lot of opportunities to underperform over long periods of time, i.e., you know, getting fired. Um, and so it's just like any strategies that actually probably will work in the past and in the future. 
it's they're usually tied to some sort of paint. So so I, I like them. I think they're reasonable. They're more in like the momentum side of things versus value. But I, I'm not saying they're going to be easy either. Um, it's they're it's the same as value. Like if it was easy, everyone's going to do it, and you're not going to earn any extra returns basically. Absolutely. And a couple of questions rolling in here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and combine a couple of them here um, since they're starting to kind of hint at some of the same things here. Um, but looking sure. down for, for the individual investor um, who's kind of wow. managing their own money, what would be kind of your, your key, points, key points of advice there? What, if you can claim a strategy they should follow or some general tenants or ideas, anything like that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so basically, before you even talk about strategy, we have a thing called focus on the facts. Where, where FACTS is an acronym for the following. F stands for fees. Lower your fees as much as possible. Unless, you're, you know, un- unless the value proposition is very unique and different, just go buy Vanguard crap. That's always your starting line, right? And then A is access, which stands for liquidity. Like all else equal, maintain your liquidity. Like the, the value of a liquidity option is so high, and a lot of people give that up via direct investment, private equity, hedge funds, blah, blah, blah. It's just... It's fine to do, but you need to consider that strongly and all else equal own liquid tradable stuff versus like crazy shit. Um, And then C is complexity. So in general, complexity is 99% of the time. That's a that's a made up stat, but you get the point tied with additional fees that you don't need to pay for because the complexity is not actually adding any value. It's part of a sales pitch, right? Because what you'll notice in like academic research and just research in general and financial markets is simplicity is beautiful and it works, but it's a tough sell, right? Like if I go sell you a value fund and all I do is buy the top 10% PE stocks, you're going to be like, well, why would I pay anything? An idiot could do that. So even though that fundamentally, let's just say, might be the best strategy, you're never going to be able to buy that because from a marketing standpoint, people are going to add 50 bells and whistles on it. And a lot of times it might actually detract value. So complexity is something to be aware of. And then T stands for taxes. You've got to focus on taxes as an individual because, you know, the 50% carry to Uncle Sam is dwarfs any sort of fees you might pay for a fund, right? If you're not avoiding taxes or I should say avoiding, uh, minimizing strategically, uh, you're wrong. And then the S, in fact, stands for search, which is in reference to and brain damage and your time. Like you got to value your time. So like a lot of times I'll run into doctors who make, you know, thousand bucks an hour and they like, they want to talk about investing like, you know, 80 hours a week. I'm like, dude, go do your job and make more money (laughs) as opposed to wasting all this time, you know, overthinking investing, man. Like that is not your HPU or your highest and best use. And and so, so overarching philosophy is focus on the facts as a, as a high level thing like minimize fees keep liquidity lower complexity lower tax and in the end what that usually brings you down to is stop stock picking and come up with a low cost tax efficient basket of etfs that you know you buy five or six tickers and you hold them for 50 years i mean that's usually the best rational decision but i also understand um, people like stock picking because it's fun so so in that case i usually recommend you do like an adventure bucket so, so maybe you do like the nice, rational, clean stuff like for 90% and then you got 10% where, you know, because it is fun to be a stock picker. Like if I ever get really rich, I'll probably go start doing that again. Um, you know, I'd keep that for your 10% bucket. And, and, and that's where, you know, you can go have fun and, and you know, test out your, your metal. But, but in all, all reality, it's, it's usually not the best solution if you're thinking clearly about these things. Absolutely. And a question we've had kind of come up uh, a couple of times in these last couple of presentations that I'll put out there, um, because you did kind of break it down into that roughly 90-10 split of your consistent value uh, or consistent returns, I guess we should say, over the long term versus the the play around section. Does cash play any kind of a point in here? Is there a certain level or anything like that of cash that people should be holding? Yeah. So, so, so as I mentioned, investing is 99% behavioral, 1% process. So if you're a hyper computer machine learning, like you have no feelings about anything, which is kind of like at this point what my brain's like, 
Probably no, right? You probably want to just build a nice diversified portfolio or try to maximize like your, your global diversification and minify, minimize fees, taxes, et cetera. And then to the extent that, that that portfolio has been optimized and kind of adjusted for like potential liquidity risk, okay, if shit hits the fan, great. We just harvest some stuff down and we, and we redeploy. Um, that's in a hyper-rational world, right? Most people aren't like that. They're humans. And so there's something beautiful and wonderful about having cash because cash, get, like if the market blows up 80% and I got cash, I don't have to sweat it because I can still pay my bills. I can buy food. I can pay my rent. So it gives you a lot of like comfort from a utility perspective, even though it obviously returns zero. Um, and then the other potential benefit of cash obviously is that optionality of like, well, I have cash when the market's blown up. But, and that, that's what I'm sure a lot of people on here have been saying because they're probably like fundamental stock picker, value investors, who have all probably underperformed and gotten smoked by the S&P because they've been 50% cash waiting for the opportunity, which is awesome. But they're also living through the reality that the optionality premium you pay by holding cash is huge and it's extremely expensive. So yes, you will probably at one point be able to call your liquidity option to go buy stocks for like a once in 20 year you know, discount. However, the premium paid for that option is the opportunity cost of all the returns you could have lost on a global diversified portfolio grinding away at five or 6% for 20 years. And, and when you actually do the math on that, I think it's a total sucker bet because implicitly what people are doing is market timing, but not knowing how to market time. Like market timing is not a value strategy, it's a momentum trend science. And, and that, that's what like all the evidence and research on market timing, like if you're using fundamentals, you're wrong because it don't work, period. And, and it shouldn't be expected to work, which we could do another whole talk about. Like you gotta be a trend follower and do things that are almost antithetical to, to a lot of value investors. So most value investors have the brain wiring to be the worst market timers on the planet because they always think in fundamentals. It, and that's a terrible way to try to time animal spirits, basically. Um, so, you know, if you need to hold cash for behavioral reasons to like to protect the kitty, to make sure um, you're not in worry of like liquidating your stock book, totally get it. If you're doing it because you're strategically waiting for the big kahuna, I think you're going to end up paying too much for that optionality, you know, for that potential benefit. But, you know, that's, that's my opinion. And that's an average effect. And I'll probably be wrong. Because uh, the market will blow up fifty percent tomorrow, but you know, such is life. Uh, <laughs> mm, for sure. All right, what else? For sure. So, on that note of indexes or a person not necessarily knowing a lot about what they're doing, wanting to kind of get in, get started, would you say that they're overpriced slash apply it to the whole market? slash continuing on the question uh, from our viewer here yeah. are we are we hitting this bubble point in the market i, I so so I, like my dna is value investor right so anytime i look at these damn markets and i'm like you gotta be shitting me like this is the craziest thing i ever seen in my life like what who would ever want to buy the s p at whatever the hell it is now 35 times like it, i get it but the problem is I read enough research and I understand different religions of the world now. And it, it just doesn't matter. The market does not care about that. What, what, it's usually markets as a whole are driven by like sentiment and animal spirits. And so what I always tell value investors is like, listen, on your stock book, definitely do value and stick through it. Try to ensure, buy cheap stocks that are high quality and don't care about how they do relative to the index. But as far as timing that exposure and worrying about like, well, should I be exposed here or there? Most people, I just say, hey, come up with a strategic allocation across your stock, bonds, or whatever alternatives. And so you don't have to worry about that because you already got natural like, you know, buoys in there. And then if you want to take the next level up and try to tactically time, which I usually don't recommend because it's also incredibly painful, the career pain is like insane, is to trend follow. So basically, it's the only thing I know of that actually can give you some, you know, better than average potential to like essentially capture some of the upside, but not lose your ass. And, and the basic concept is if a market's in a long term trend, own it. It doesn't matter what it's valued at. But the minute a market busts long term trend, hedge 
or maybe pull chips off the table. Like if you want to get fancy about it and, and you need something to kind of like keep you in your seat, like I'm a big fan of trend falling, but, but again, and I, I'm a believer, I got a lot of my own capital on trend falling. We have a trend falling product, but also the reality of trend falling is the last 10 years, trend falling has been one of the worst ideas on the planet because essentially trend falling is a form of insurance. And over the last 10 years in S and P, even if you have a long-term trend, you know, because the market just goes up, 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 it'll drop and go up, 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 you know, trend falling has, has came at a, a huge cost as opposed to just buying whole. Like, I still think it's a great strategy for the long haul, but if, but if your criteria is like, hey, 10 year is my horizon, it's not probably a good idea. But if, if, you're, if your objective is, hey, I wanna participate but not get destroyed, and, and you got an evergreen, I think trend falling would be a way to approach that versus valuation-based timing, it, which again, I have a lot of empathy for, for the person because I agree and I can't even stand looking at the stupid stock market and, and being like, why do I own this thing? But that I learned to just not care because the market doesn't care what I think. And I just got to focus on systems and processes. So yeah, gotcha. that's, that's kind of my convoluted answer. For sure. And interesting uh, question coming in here. Um, sure. that, that I guess we'll, we'll, we'll toss you back into time for a little bit. Where yeah. would you start as a value investor? What kind of education would you start with? Um, and kind of on that note, keeping in mind that stock picking doesn't necessarily make sense for most people. So, so the irony is I think stock, if you, if you like markets and you want to get in the markets, unfortunately, I still believe that being a stock picker is, is fundamentally the best training you can get, right? So if you got a few grand and you're starting off, even though, yeah, in theory, you should go buy a Vanguard fund and not listen to idiots like me, um, you should probably go do some stock picking, which is why I actually like Robinhood because it gets you in the game, you learn how it works. Like, I, I think it's great practice for everyone to start off as a stock picker. Because I have plenty of PhD buddies who got PhDs in finance from Chicago, which is like the best place in the world. And if you ask them, hey, can you throw a limit order on your Schwab account? They'd be like, what's that? Um, and, and so some, sometimes you got to do some practical stuff to like just get a basic grasp, right? It's like, you know, like if you always outsource your oil change on your car, you know, you're not going to ever know how to change oil or how the engine works, right? Sometimes, yeah, maybe you'll outsource that down the road because that's a lot smarter than getting your shirt black oil shit all over. But it might be good to at least learn how to change the oil once. So stock picking, I think, is a great practice for people that want to get their hands dirty. But simultaneous to that, you should put constraints on it. Like I said, like have a book that's stock picking, have a book that's rational, clean. So you still get the learning, but you can't destroy yourself. And then I also recommend people at least attempt to read a lot about behavioral psychology, like you know Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is boring as hell because it's like a reference book. But it, it's a great glimpse into like how the human mind works, where it has frailties, like, like where you break down. And even though as a human, when you even know those, you're still going to break down. The more you're cognizant of your own you know, mental uh, fragility, the better you're going to be, whether it's a stock picker, that, whatever it is. Um, so those would be the two training grounds. Like learn about behavior, like learn about why you shouldn't be stock picking in the first place. But at the same time, you should be stock picking because it gives you some hands-on practical experience and learn how to change the oil uh, at least one time. And then down the road, you should probably outsource it, but at least you got your hands dirty and you kind of know how the engine works. It would be my general philosophy on that. Absolutely. And we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and call this our last one here and we'll, we'll, we'll hit on a, a hot topic one here to, to end it out. Oh, great. Um, question. No politics, man. No politics. No, no, no <laughs> politics. Um, but asking, what's your your current read of some of these the the big Chinese internet stocks, and um, I'll add in kind of some of these emerging markets overall as well. Yes. Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, private property rights and freedom in general. Um, so, so I, I think at a certain price, every investment is good, right? And EM, all those markets are really, really cheap. Um, and you should always focus on cheapness and quality. It's just the one thing to consider in like EM markets and like areas where there's like dictators and authoritarian people in charge, 
is, is they don't necessarily believe in property rights. Um, and I'm not saying this is happening, but you always want to you know, account for like the existential risk of, hey, stock market is worth zero today, which has actually happened in China. Um, and I'm not saying it would happen, but anything is possible. So one of the things about EM is, is you don't want to buy a sucker value bet where, where you, know, you always want to account for the fact that they could just steal my property. Um, but to the extent that the, you know, the margin of safety is big enough, and you know, maybe I think probably China, you know, maybe in Russia, in some of these totally chaotic places, um, you know, maybe at a certain price, there is some good values out there. And, and again, I, I'm a quant now, and I don't get in the weeds, but I'm sure a good fundamental stock picker. Like I, I talked to uh, Harris Kupperman, his name is Cuppy. Uh, uh, he, he's, he's, he's the type of guy where he gets in the weeds. He's like digging in like the Iraq stock market. You know, I'm sure you could probably get some at two times PE ratio that's got a 10% dividend yield where, okay, that probably accounts for the fact that, uh, you know, you might die if you go do due diligence on the firm, um, but might be worth it. So, yeah, it's like anything. Margin of safety can make anything a good buy, regardless of how ugly and nasty it is. I, I'm just not an expert on particular issues right now. Absolutely. Well, Wiss, that is going to round out our time for questions today. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure, a wonderful presentation, uh, lots of love from our audience out here as well. Uh, for that audience, for those of you out there, like I mentioned earlier, there is a full recording available here on YouTube shortly, as well as on Guru Focus. If you enjoyed everything today, please take a moment to like, comment, subscribe to the channel, give us a little bit of momentum there. We really do appreciate it. Uh, from us here at Guru Focus, to you, Wes, and to the audience, we wish you the best moving forward, and hopefully everything will pan out for you. Cool. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, and good luck to everyone out there.